God has called us unto purity, unto holiness, and it is a pure word that we have received. The word made flesh is the creative word of God that is spoken in truth and purity. There is no mixture of men's hypocrisy, of the ways of this world that flatter, that try to draw people by dishonest means for the purposes of gain, power, money. All these things come from the corruption of flesh and the systems of men. The author of that confusion is the one who desires to sit in the throne of God, calling himself God. But the word that we have received of the master is a word of purity, a word that is undefiled. And the Lord is purifying our hearts and minds through a process of trial, tribulation. Well, we echo the word of the psalmist who said, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. And we desire to have pure hands, to have clean hands, a pure heart. O oh God, create in us a clean heart, a pure heart. We have purity through the nature of Jesus when we receive the word of God and we're born again of that incorruptible word and i'm so thankful that it is incorruptible and yet in our natural humanity corruption is there but we have a desire for this corruption this corrupted man to put on incorruption and this takes place through the miraculous new birth that we receive in christ by that living pure word of the father and then we grow in grace we're transformed as we behold the beauty, the purity, the holiness of the Lord. We're transformed into that same image uh, from glory to glory. And yet we have to follow on to know the Lord. And it is through much tribulation, through much pressure, that we enter into the kingdom of God and into the position where we're counted worthy to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ, to rule over our enemies to have the dominion that was promised to Adam in the beginning. But the Lord is sure, his word is sure, he will cause us to walk in his ways, cause us to have clean hands, cause us to have a pure heart before people so that we don't come speaking the words of men to try to convince people, but it is the word of God that brings repentance, that brings regeneration, and that brings new and true lasting life in the kingdom of God. We're continuing in this study that we're doing in Thessalonians. We're starting in the second chapter. And we're speaking of the word that is pure and a call to the kingdom of God. First verse, Paul writing to the Thessalonians says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. So Paul in the previous chapter, was commending the Thessalonians, those that had received the word in Thessalonica, that they had received the word through much tribulation. And he's also condemn, uh, commending the word that was preached by the apostle and by those that were with him, those messengers that were sent from God. They had been purified. They had walked in purity before men. They weren't doing what they were doing for vain sake or to gain power, to gain riches, to rule over others, but they were in sincerity, had a heart to see people come into the kingdom of God that they might be freed from the yoke of religious bondage, bondage to idolatry, bondage to all that captivates the minds of men in this world, that they might come into the freedom and the liberty of the kingdom of God. But it was all about the motive, and that's what the Lord is working with us and working in us pure and holy motives, that our desire is to bless others and to be used of God in purity, not in hypocrisy, not in desires for position of power, for money, for popularity's sake, but that we would truly be the messengers of God in Christ, knowing that it is through tribulation, it is through trial, and that's an unpopular message. But again, we'll need to revisit what these men that preached the gospel to those in Thessalonica had to go through. 
and what even those in Thessalonica received themselves of their fellow countrymen because of the message, because of the truth of Christ. It wasn't popular. It caused people to suffer. And all those who are in Christ, all those that follow on to know the Lord are going to suffer some persecution. And this is a continuing theme here in this letter to the Thessalonians. Again, if we revisit Acts, the 16th chapter, which gives kind of a historical background of the church there in Thessalonians and how they received the message, this starts out with the vision that Paul had received that brought him into that area. And I'm going to read this out of the message version, starting in the ninth verse, uh, Acts 16. It says, that night Paul had a dream. A Macedonian stood on the far shore and called across the sea, come over to Macedonia and help us. The dream gave, gave Paul his map. We went to work at once, th getting things ready to cross over to Macedonia. All the pieces had come together. We knew now for sure that God had called us to preach the good news to the Europeans. Putting out from the harbors at Troas, we made a straight run for Samothrace. The next day we tied up at New City and walked from there to Philippi, the main city in that part of Macedonia, and even more importantly, a Roman colony. We lingered there several days. On the Sabbath, we left the city and went down along the river where we had heard that there was to be a prayer meeting. We took our place with the women who had gathered there and talked with them. One woman, Lydia, was from Thyatira, a dealer of expensive textiles known to be a God-fearing woman. And she listened with intensity to what was being said. The master gave her a trusting heart and she believed. After she was baptized, along with everyone in her household, she said in a surge of hospitality, If you're confident that I'm in this with you and believe in the Master truly, come home with me and be my guests. We hesitated, but she wouldn't take no for an answer. One day, on our way to the place of prayer, a slave girl ran into us. She was a psychic and with her fortune telling, made a lot of money for the people who owned her. She started following Paul around calling everyone's attention to us by yelling out, These men are working for the Most High God. They're laying out the road of salvation for you. She did this for a number of days until Paul, finally fed up with her, turned and commanded the spirit that possessed her, Out, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. And it was gone just like that. When her owners saw that her lu their lucrative little business was suddenly bankrupt, they went after Paul and Silas, roughed them up, and dragged them into the market square. Then the police arrested them and pulled them into a court with this accusation, These men are disturbing the peace. Dangerous Jewish agitators subverting our Roman law and order. By this time, the crowd had turned into a restless mob out for blood. The judges went along with the mob, had Paul and Silas's clothes ripped off, and ordered a public beating. After beating them black and blue, they threw them into jail, telling the jailkeeper to put them under heavy guard so there would be no chance of escape. He did just that, threw them into the maximum security cell in the jail and clamped leg irons on them. Along about midnight, Paul and Silas were at prayer and singing a robust hymn to God. The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then, without warning, a huge earthquake. The jailhouse tottered. Every door flew open. All the prisoners were loose. Startled from sleep, the jailer saw all the doors swinging loose on their hinges. Assuming that all the prisoners had escaped, he pulled out his sword and was about to do himself in, figuring he was as good as dead anyway, when Paul stopped him. Don't do that. We're all still here. Nobody's run away. The jailer got a torch and ran inside. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. He led them out of the jail and asked, Sirs, what do I have to do to be saved? to really live. They said, put your entire trust in the master Jesus. Then you'll live as you were meant to live and everyone in your house included. They went on to spell out in detail the story of the master. The entire family got in on this part. They never did get to bed that night. The jailer made them feel at home, dressed their wounds, and then he couldn't wait till morning, was baptized, he and everyone in his family. 
There in his home, he had food set out for a festive meal. It was a night to remember. He and his entire family had put their trust in God. Everyone in the house was in on, on the celebration. At daybreak, the court judges sent officers with the instructions, release these men. The jailer gave Paul the message. The judges sent word that you're free to go on your way. Congratulations, go in peace. But Paul wouldn't budge. He told the officers, they beat us up in public and threw us in jail, Roman citizens in good standing, and now they want to get us out of the way on the sly without anyone knowing? Nothing doing. If they want us out of here, let them come themselves and lead us out in broad daylight. When the officers reported this, the judges panicked. They had no idea that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. They hurried over and apologized, personally escorted them from the jail, and then asked them if they wouldn't please leave the city. Walking out of the jail, Paul and Silas went straight to Lydia's house, saw their friends again, encouraged them in their faith, and only then went on their way. Now that is the story that leads Paul and Silas then to Thessalonica. And you can see clearly the tribulation, the pressure, the trial, the persecution that they suffered, leading them then to Thessalonica. And this was all by the ordained plan of the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, leading them and guiding them. So then, starting in Acts 17, they took the road south through Amphipolis and Apollonia to Thessalonica, where there was a community of Jews. Paul went to their meeting place, as he usually did when he came to a town, and for three Sabbaths running, he preached to them from the scriptures. He opened up the texts so they understood what they'd been reading all their lives that the Messiah absolutely had to be put to death and raised from the dead. There were no other options. And that this Jesus I'm introducing you to is that Messiah. Some of them were won over and joined the ranks with Paul and Silas, among them a great many God-fearing Greeks and a considerable number of women from the aristocracy. But the hardline Jews became furious over the conversions. Mad with jealousy, they rounded up a bunch of brawlers off the streets and soon had an ugly mob terrorizing the city as they hunted down Paul and Silas. They broke into Jason's house, thinking that Paul and Silas were there. When they couldn't find them, they collared Jason and his friends instead and dragged them before the city fathers, yelling hysterically, these people are out to destroy the world. And now they've shown up on our doorstep, attacking everything we hold dear. And Jason is hiding them. These traitors and turncoats who say Jesus is king and Caesar is nothing. The city fathers and the crowd of people were totally alarmed by what they heard. They made Jason and his friends post heavy bail and let them go while they investigated the charges. That night, under cover of darkness, their friends Paul got Paul and Silas out of town as fast as they could. They sent them to Berea, where they again met with the Jewish community. They were treated a lot better there than in Thessalonica. So this is the context whereby this church here in Thessalonians received the message. It was in trial. It was in tribulation. It was in the context of great persecution. And we don't recognize many times the tremendous blessing that this uncomfortable predicament of persecution and tribulation bring. They bring a true conviction of Christ in the message. We see the reality that Jesus truly did suffer and lay down his life for others. He said, no greater love is there than this than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. And he called those that were with him friends, even though they were not righteous men. He doesn't call people when they are righteous. He calls them when they are unrighteous, when they are sinners. Paul himself said, I am the chief of sinners, and yet God showed grace. He, he showed me favor when I was a blasphemer, when I was a killer of Christians, when I persecuted the church. Christ Jesus himself said, Paul or Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, who you're, perse who you're persecuting. And Saul, at that time, his name was Saul, he was putting Christians into jail and trying to put them to death. He was trying to destroy 
the church of the living God. The Lord did not hold that against him. He called Saul out of his ignorance, and the man became the great apostle Paul, whose letters we have record of today that are a great encouragement. That's what we're reading today. But this was all birthed and born out of persecution. Most of the letters, we have this glorious imagination, this romantic ideal in our mind of how great the gospel was preached and the conversions and all these kinds of things. And we forget that most of the New Testament was written from jail cells. Uh, Paul and the other apostles, John also on the Isle of Patmos, these men suffered for their faith and they fulfilled the scripture. They fulfilled the commandment of the Lord that you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. You're going to have to lay down your life for others. Just as I've laid down my life for you, just as I've washed the feet of the disciples, you're going to do likewise. And this isn't something that we do by our own effort and by our own strength. The Lord leads us and we overcome by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimonies, and by loving not our life unto the death. How do we, how do we accomplish this? How do we do this? By the power of of the indwelling life of Christ. It's the spirit of Christ that's within us that causes us to overcome. And this is the message of hope that we preach, that Jesus is in you of a truth to cause you to pass through the trials that you've been ordained unto in this life, the pressure, but that it's for your benefit, not just for your benefit, but for the benefit of your family, for your friends, for all those who see you go through these situations as Paul and Silas did in prison, singing songs, praising God in the midst of terrible persecution. They were beaten openly, stripped down naked, beaten in front of people, even though they were just walking in the plan of God. It was a vision of the Lord that brought them into Macedonia. And here it brought them right into persecution. And this is the way of the Lord. If we'll stay with the, the, the way of God, he will bring us into a place of purity where we can Say, as Paul did to the Thessalonians, those in Thessalonica, we didn't, we're not trying to minister something for our own glorification or benefit, but this is for you. And this is a labor of love, a sacrifice of our life in Christ. If we look again in Acts, the 14th chapter, 21st verse, again, a record of them preaching and having people come against them, tribulation, trial. But I want a specific verse here, and we want to look real quick just at the Greek. Uh, verse 21 of Acts 14, it says, And when they had preached the gospel to the city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Verse 22, Strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must, through much tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Now, if we look a little closer at that scripture in Acts 14, 22, when he says, through much tribulation, we look at the original Greek and he says, and that through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom. That word tribulation in the Greek is philipsis, philipsis, and it is oppressing or oppressing together, pressure. Of course, it's translated as oppression, affliction, distress, straits. But the root there and the center of the meaning of that word is a pressing, pressing together or pressure. And if we can real quick, we want to show some analogies of how the Lord uses this pressure, this tribulation. He says it's a must that you go through this pressure to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, first of all, look at the account of what Jesus taught concerning entering in to the kingdom. You can't enter in. A rich man, <clears throat> very difficult to enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, you have to lose all of the baggage. You have to be pressed through a narrow way. There's a great purpose in this. But we have even greater analogies or a symbolic story that we can share that proves the importance of tribulation, of going through this pressure, how it brings purity, how it brings great worth to the life of the one who allows the Lord to lead them through these difficult places. If we look at the analogy of a diamond, and you can study, you can look this up and study it out. Other men have 
done so. And I have to give credit to others who have studied this out and come to an understanding that a diamond is a perfect example of something that is created. Maybe it begins out more or less worthless and it becomes very precious, so much so that it's one of the most precious gems on the face of the earth today. And it requires intense heat to create a diamond. It's down in the depths of the earth that a diamond is created under intense heat and high pressure. And not only that, but it takes considerable time that could be considered a parable for that which we have to go through, that there's time involved. And this process that a diamond goes through that it creates. And I don't understand all of the science behind it, uh, I, but I, I recognize, as the scientists have explained, that it is intense heat, intense pressure, and considerable time, we're talking about hundreds or thousands of years, for this diamond to be created, but it becomes what is known to be the hardest natural substance on the earth, highly resistant to chemicals, and exceptionally high in transparency. And think of that as an analogy for those entering into the kingdom of God. The intense heat, that could be fire, a trial of fire that you have to go through, pressure, being squeezed, being subject to situations that we would not choose of our own. And the time that it, it seems when you go through trials that it's never ending, as though it could go on forever. And yet it is only a time. And Paul said, I consider that the trials, the sufferings of this present age aren't worthy to be compared with what is being worked out in those who love God and are the called according to his purposes. The hardness, the strength that it creates, the hardest substance that you can cut glass with a diamond. You, it's, it's so hard. It can't be it hardly can be destroyed. The strength of a diamond. Think of the rock, our rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything can be shaken. Everything can be destroyed. And yet that word remains. How it's highly resistant to chemicals. See, our God is unchanging. And that word that we've been begotten of is unchanging, incorruptible. Can't be changed by exterior influences. Exceptionally high in transparency. A diamond, you can see right through it. It is as glass. And that's how the Lord is creating us. He's making us, changing us, forming us in Christ. This is an incredible picture of what we go through, what the Lord allows us to experience for our benefit, for our blessing. For I consider Paul writing to the Romans 8.18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And this is the working of these trials, of this tribulation that it creates something great in us, or it, it actually brings a purification to that which the Lord is, we're being recreated in Christ Jesus unto good works. This requires time, tribulation. Yes, the seed of Christ is incorruptible, perfect, absolutely beauty, beautiful in holiness, true, awesome, and yet, we are being transformed from glory to glory. Another analogy would be the birthing of Christ that's taking place. The, Christ is being formed through pressure, through tri tribulation. Jesus said in John 16, 33, said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Same word, pressure. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And another analogy besides just the diamond is how Christ is being formed in us as a newborn babe is being formed in a mother who's pregnant, who's carrying a child. And it's, you can't see what all is happening in the, develop, in the process of development. And yet there's a child that's being formed, that's being grown on the inside. This is how it is with Christ, that there's a formation that's taking place of this life of the Son of God on the inside of the believers, of those that are going on to know Christ. And it's through trial, it's through tribulation, through pressure, that that baby is birthed. Formed, yes, through trial. Think of the process of a mother and what she has to go through in that, those nine months. 
how there can be some suffering, there can be some difficulty in the body. And it's all for the forming of that child. Uh, Jesus spoke of this. John 16, 19, he says, Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me again, or you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Verse 21, and this is the verses that I want. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been formed into the, born into the world. Therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. Well, this is something to consider and to think on that Christ is being formed in a people, and through the pressure of birthing pains, through the trial of going through the process of the Lord being manifest from out of the life of the believer, out of the life of the child of God, uh, out of the woman, so to speak, which is the church. And she gives birth to a man-child who's to reign with the Lord with a rod of iron, There's all symbolic uh, pictures in this, but it speaks of the kingdom of God being manifest in the earth and ruling over all those things that Adam was ordained from the very beginning. He was put as a ruler over the earth and all things were made subject to him. Well, he fell from that position as it was ordained of the father so that we might through Christ, through the second Adam, through the quickening spirit, be brought up into the position through our growth, through our maturing in him. And think of how uh, it is through the, the operation of the body of Christ that we grow. All working together, but it's not always seemingly pleasant. Iron sharpens iron, as the proverb says. So in other words, there's going to be times when things seem to be working against us, and yet it's sharpening us. All of these things point to this blessing of the trial, of the tribulation that we go through, the pressure that we go through for our edification and for the edification of the body of Christ and ultimately for the salvation and the restoration of all things. Praise be unto the living God. Back to Thessalonians, the second chapter, starting again in the first verse. So he says, For you know, for you yourselves know, brethren, that your, our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated, At Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict, for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. There's the there's the testing of the purity to see what's in the heart. Verse 5, For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have been, might have made demands as apostles of Christ. So this was not about uh, popularity, not about money, not about what the apostles, not about what those who carried the message, Paul and those that were with him, not about what they could receive out of the message, out of the preaching. This has become a doctrine of devils today, of what blessing you can receive from preaching the gospel, that you can gain notoriety, that you can be somebody that is well-known, famous. Uh, how, How many preachers are after fame? Lord, help us from that. How many that carry the gospel are after filthy lucre, desiring to gain wealth, by collecting offerings or by raising money. And then they pocket the gains themselves and become wealthy men on account of the gospel. Uh, Let it be far from us to do such things, to use, and, and not only that, but to flatter people, to bring them into our circles so that we can gain power over people. That is not the purpose of the gospel whatsoever. And the Lord removes that through, through these, these things that are difficult. This is not about financial gain, but about 
revealing the truth of Christ, the the mystery of godliness, that Jesus Christ was brought into the earth and became nothing so that we might receive all of the glory of the kingdom in him. Look back at verse 7, first, uh, Second Thessalonians there, verse 7, it says, But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. So Paul and those that were with him determined to work with their own hands so that they didn't require money from anybody, that so that it didn't look like they were coming among the people just so that they could take from them their goods. They weren't there to receive from men. They were there to give. And this was the blessing that Jesus spoke about. It's better to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, if we give out the gospel and speak the message of Christ and live before others as one that looks to get something out of it, then we have perverted the gospel. And not, not to say, we know that it's scripturally sound and according to God's way that people that preach the, the gospel can receive the benefits of having their natural needs taken care of by those that receive the gospel. That's, Paul even wrote of it, using the analogy of you don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. In other words, you don't, you don't keep him from eating that which when he's working, he's allowed to eat because of his work. Okay. Write what is in front of him and the people can supply the needs for those that are ministering the gospel. All right. We understand that. But Paul himself wouldn't use it because he didn't want to pervert the gospel or allow people to find fault by saying this man is just coming among us. He's preaching, yes, he's teaching, yes, he may be telling us the truth, but he's doing it for selfish gain. He's doing it so that he can make money, so that he can have his living taken care of. No, Paul actually went among them and worked with his own hands. And there are those of us who the Lord has called us to such a life that we we make our own way so that we can't bring disrespect to God's message, so that we aren't defiling the message as, as so many people look at the church and say it's, it's hypocrisy. They're speaking about faith, trusting God. They can't even trust God to supply the needs that they have for their body. So in these cases, we follow Paul. We follow the administration of the Spirit that worked in him. And we thank the Lord that he's allowed us to do that. And we don't find fault with those who live by the gospel, by offerings, by people giving. But here in this case, Paul didn't do so. And I think he had to live that way so that he could prove that he wasn't doing what he was doing. Those that were ministering the kingdom of God were not doing so for money or for popularity, but they were doing so to fulfill the commandment and the love of God towards his people. Back in verse 10, it says, you are witnesses and God also how devoutly and justly And blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And this is the glory that we've received, to walk with the Lord in his kingdom, to actually partake of the rulership of the authority of Christ, to see the world changed and transformed by the coming and the appearing of the God-man. This is a great and holy calling that the Lord has brought us unto. And he has, it's, it's by the grace of the Lord that we're called in, and yet we have to press. The Lord presses through us. This is the trial. This is the tribulation of our faith, that we continue to go through the pressure. Praise the Lord. And we do so in rest. It is a dichotomy. Seems to be opposing forces. That while we labor, We do so to enter into his rest, to enter into the promise where we know the works were finished from the foundation of the world. All things are done in Christ. We see the end finished because 
the beginning has already walked through all of it. The Lord is the end and the beginning. He's become all things to us so that we can rest in his love. And yet in that resting, we press by the power of the Holy Spirit who presses us, who causes us to go through hardship, difficult circumstances, difficult situations. And all of that is to our benefit and especially for the benefit of a groaning creation who desires to see purity, holiness, righteousness, and they see it in Jesus Christ. There is a great purity that comes through tribulation, and this is confirmed in Revelation 7. Just read a few verses here, finishing up today. After these things, this is verse 9, verse 9. After these things, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessings and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who have come out of great tribulation, great pressure, and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And this is the great and glorious promise that we're given through the word of God, who is true and faithful, a true and faithful witness of the plan of the Father, the one who works out everything according to his own mind, according to his own plan, the wisdom that is beyond all other wisdom. And he has called us unto a kingdom of purity, of life and light. And yet, as we're saying, as the theme is, it is through pressure. It is through tribulation. That's how we put on the garments that are clean and white. The purity of Christ is put on through the trials of following the Lamb, through His sufferings, through His trials. And yet, if we suffer with Him, we'll reign with Him. Amen. And what is the suffering? Does it mean we need to have suffering in our body from sickness or cancer or some other things? Well, God could use those things. But we prefer to suffer for righteousness sake, by following the Lord, the trial that we receive is through the affliction that comes because of the word of God, because the word is preached, because we're following the Lord and through following the Lord, hardship comes, difficulty, pressure. Thank God in this world, we may have tribulation, but we can look unto the Lord Jesus Christ for he has overcome all things and we have victory in him through and through and we become as Paul who has such great compassion that we don't pay attention to the difficulty but we're looking unto those whom we love we have the heart of the Lord in our in our chest beating for a creation beating for our brothers and sisters who are out here in the world our beloved the church we desire to see them come into their inheritance. And so we love them as a mother cher cherishes and nourishes her children, gives her life for her children to live. That's the desire that comes into our heart through Christ. And then we become as a father, a father who uh, corrects, chastens, rebukes his children. You have many uh, teachers, 10,000 in Christ, but very few fathers. The father is the one, he doesn't look to receive anything from the children, but he looks to give all that he has as an inheritance unto his sons. God has given us that heart 
of a father, that we desire to see the sons of God, the children of God, grow up into their inheritance. Praise the Lord. This is all about entering in and fulfilling the destiny, the plan of God for our lives in his glorious kingdom. We thank God for this truth. And we thank God for the message, the word of God that never fails. And we keep our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith, knowing he is able to keep us through all these things that we might enter fully in with him into the land of promise, which is the very life, the fullness of Christ. Amen. The Lord bless you. Look forward to the next time we'll be together.